From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is from the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. We begin with a special report from Colombia. Late last month, the Colombian Air Force bombarded a remote area of the Choco Department. The government said it was an operation against ELN guerrillas, but the bombs landed in an indigenous reserve, and at least one indigenous child was killed. Our correspondent, Loria Hoyos, has traveled to the region, and this is the first of her reports. We navigated for four hours through the San Juan River, from Buenaventura to the indigenous safe house of Chacpiantordo. The territory was recently bombarded by military forces who say they were fighting the ELN guerrilla. The bombs hit the banks of the Tordo River, close to the homes of the community. I needed a little hut to plant food. I used to come here to fish or to hunt. I support my children with that food. The community took us to the attack site they showed us the huts where they worked, which have now been destroyed. We could feel the pain in their silence and see it through their eyes. But they could have lost more than their livelihood that night. They could have lost their lives. If we would have been here, we would have been dead. At least we wouldn't be seeing any of this. The indigenous communities are now afraid to go back to the Tordo River for fear the attacks could come again. They are also concerned military forces will mistake them for ELN guerrillas and capture, or worse, kill them. We are enduring hunger because we cannot go over there. We are afraid because of the attacks, as we don't know when that can happen again. We are scared. The indigenous people of the region also believe some explosives are still in their territory. The Afro-Indigenous population sees this as a direct attack to the campesinos. A war cannot be appeased this way, killing people, killing civilians, going against communities, damaging their crops and homes. That is not the way to end a war. Maybe we need new political measures and for new dialogue about peace. After leaving the Tordo River, we went to a farmhouse at the indigenous safe house in Chakpian. The Wunan community members say they wanted to escape the attack on a motorboat that night, but they didn't, because they feared that could be even more dangerous. We could see a small plane overflying the area. The attack scared our children. The adults got together and we saw the motorboat that was ready to leave. The people of the community were ready to leave. Food shortages have begun. Community leaders are now distributing tuna and rice contributed by nearby community. Uncertainty is growing, but the people are still too fearful to continue with their daily lives. Colombia's former guerrilla group, now turned political party, the FARC, has organized a truth and reconciliation event. FARC members talked to the relatives of the victim of an attack on the Nugal Social Club in Bogota 15 years ago. The former combatants took responsibility for the attack, which left 36 people dead and 200 injured back in 2003. They also categorized the attack as unjustified. The FARC leaders said this act contributed to the truth and reconciliation process for peace in the country. Let's remember those who perished in this unjustifiable act, workers, professionals, parents and children of every country, and didn't deserve to die. And the members of the FARC are also calling for a pack of non-violence during the Colombian election campaign. Last week, the FARC temporarily suspended its campaign because of threats against candidates. Their statement says, We signed the agreements in Havana on the understanding that with their implementation, conditions would be met to generate reforms historically demanded by Colombian society. We have completely fulfilled the pact, and despite failures to fully implement the agreement, we decided to take part in the current election. However, the restrictions and limitations are obvious. We even forced to temporarily suspend our electoral campaign. This will continue until we see a significant change in these circumstances. And the head of the Colombian military forces says there is zero chance the army would cross into the border with Venezuela. He was responding to Venezuela's state prosecutor, Tarak William Saab, who said that Bogota was planning to, plotting to attack the country. 
Last week, the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, promised to send more than 3,000 troops and police to the border to control the entry of Venezuelan migrants. It's a very professional assignment geared toward eliminating some illegal trails in specific predetermined areas, including areas that have been coordinated in the past with Venezuelan authorities. So the chance that some troops or men from the armed forces will cross to the other side of the border for action or by mistake or because they are lost is zero, zero, absolutely zero. Ecuador's President Lenin Moreno will travel to Colombia today to meet with President Juan Manuel Santos. Our correspondent, Jose Manuel Jimenez, has more. Today at around 3 p.m., Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno will arrive to the city of Pereira, where he will meet President Juan Manuel Santos. Meanwhile, today in the afternoon, meetings will be held between different ministers of Colombia and Ecuador to discuss topics such as security and defense, infrastructure, environmental, economic, and commercial issues. Tomorrow, the heads of state will meet at around 10 a.m. in the Exofuturo Convention Center. There they will discuss topics such as the peace talks with the ELN and the Colombian government in the city of Quito. Also, the binational plan for the integration of borders. This is important for both countries since drug traffickers use the border to create camps where cocaine is processed. This border also receives thousands of Colombian refugees. According to figures, 95% of the refugees that are in Ecuador are Colombian. 400 people cross the border daily to Ecuador. An agreement will be signed tomorrow afternoon on these topics. A number of countries, including the United States and Colombia, have already said they will not recognize Venezuela's presidential election on April 22nd. In Venezuela, however, people are demanding that the decision to go to the polls be recognized. Laura Prada has more. Venezuela is heading towards elections. Laughter, songs and joy are the worst threats facing the public as they go to parks to enjoy these days of carnival with their family. The people's message is clear. That this will all get fixed or start to be fixed after the elections, all we are looking for is tranquility and to leave behind this conflict we have seen. One of these conflicts is the economic war the country is going through. Due to an economic blockade and sanctions imposed by the United States since last year. However, people like Joanna and Robert are banking on peace. We are happy because we are going to win again, because there's support for us, for our children. What we want is peace and joy. My contribution is to support these children and, of course, to support the revolution. What else? And to thank the government for the support it has given us. Despite these calls from the government and ordinary people for peace and dialogue, there is still voices calling for a military humanitarian intervention and trying to prevent the election. They will have to demonstrate to the Venezuelan people whether they really have commitment to democracy, as they say. All the electoral guarantees are in place. If they decide not to participate, then they must be thinking about an alternative to dialogue, peace and coexistence. The polling agency Interlaces estimates that 69% of the population will exercise its right to vote, numbers which confirm that Venezuelans want to live in peace. Laura Prada, Telesur Caracas. And an explosion in an electrical substation in the Venezuelan state of Miranda caused a blackout in several cities around the country. The Minister of Energy, Luis Mota Dominguez, said on Instagram that the National Electricity Corporation helped restore power and that the fire was being controlled. He also denounced this as an attempt to sabotage the power service. And Venezuela's foreign minister, Jorge Ariasa, has arrived in Dominica as he starts the second leg of his diplomatic tour around Latin America and the Caribbean. Our correspondent, Esther Yanez, is traveling with Ariasa and sent this report as they left Caracas. Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza is turning a new leaf on his diplomacy tour around several countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. This time, he will visit Dominica, El Salvador and the Dominican Republic with the objective to strengthen Venezuela's ties with these nations. According to Arreaza, the tour is to promote peace. The first leg of his trip took him to several other countries in the region. He reiterated this point as he began a new round of visits that will end next weekend. 
This comes at an important time, as the presidential election will be held on April 22nd, another reason to continue with his trip in order to strengthen diplomatic ties that will benefit the bilateral relations of Venezuela and the countries of the region. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting on. Sometimes I think we have forgotten about the importance of the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine and what it meant to this, this hemisphere and maintaining those shared values. So I think it's as, it's as relevant today as it was the day it was written. Welcome back. Guatemala's former president, Alvaro Colom, has been arrested over corruption charges. Colom is being investigated by the Public Ministry and the International Commission Against Impunity. More in the next story. Guatemala's former president, Alvaro Colom, was captured by the police after being accused of graft and corruption. The Public Ministry and the International Commission Against Impunity said that Colom authorized a transfer worth millions of dollars to purchase a large fleet of buses for public transport. Investigations found that a fraudulent scheme was set up to deceive the public administration. The scheme allowed criminal activities, especially the approval of a government agreement, to disburse $35 million from the Guatemalan state. The agreement, endorsed by Colom, was also signed by 10 of his cabinet ministers who were also captured. Investigators said different private businesses received the $35 million, a way for those accused to get hold of the money. Colom intervened directly in this and facilitated the procedure through the endorsement of this agreement. He allowed this agreement to be approved without the necessary reports and documents. He also didn't call for a meeting with all his ministers. The state disbursement served to purchase 3,143 buses, part of a system of public transportation also known as Transurbano, but the businesses that receive the money only use some 300 buses. We still need to know what happened to more than $2 million. We are still investigating that flow of money. The trial's first hearing was scheduled for February 23rd. Colom and his former ministers were sent to the military jail of Mariscal Zavala, joining former President Ato Perez Molina. With just a few days before the elections for deputies and mayors, communities and social movements in El Salvador are demanding that the Arena Party give back donations made to victims of the 2001 earthquake. Gathered in front of the headquarters of the Arena Party, a large group of people are protesting against the misuse of $10 million donated by Taiwan's government. People say the party used the money for its electoral campaign. They should be ashamed if they stole that money. 
We still don't know how many people died without receiving anything during the earthquakes, and all because the money donated for them disappeared. The word transparency is too big for Arena. They are thieves. Social organizations marched towards the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, asking for the disqualification of the Arena Party. Arena is involved in severe corruption. They stole money from public funds. They arrogated it and used it to finance their campaign. Meanwhile, preparations for elections of the next March 4th go on. The ballots to elect deputies and mayors are almost ready and some data transmission tests have been done. We succeeded in transmitting 90% of data, and it was done in record time, never seen before in electoral processes, because the scanners are top technology. This means that around 60,000 ballots will be transmitted in less than an hour. International observers have arrived, like this one from the European Union, spread around the country's 14 departments. We will focus on observing the run-up process, campaigns, elections day and the count. We will produce a preliminary report and then a final one. Meanwhile, political parties continue campaigning, which include visits to communities and political events. Campaigning will end on February 28th, four days before the election. In Bolivia, another explosion in the city of Oruro has killed two people and injured 10 others. The blast destroyed several buildings and vehicles. Oruro's governor, Victor Hugo Vasquez, says the explosion is being investigated as a criminal attack. And challenges are mounting for deported dreamers from the U.S. Mexican immigrants from the United States who were deported say they no longer recognize their homeland. Our correspondent, Pablo Perez, has more. The first days in Mexico were hard for Jose. He's a dreamer, a name given to the young people who moved to the U.S. with their parents illegally as children. And despite also being educated there, are still considered undocumented. U.S. authorities deported Jose to a country that's not his home. At first it was difficult for me to be in Mexico City. I walked around here and didn't know how to find shelter or a job. I was afraid of walking in the streets at night. Despite knowing some Mexican traditions, their native language is English, which brings problems. People in the street tell you, hey, speak Spanish, we speak Spanish here. They see you as a gringo, and I tell them that after so many time, you adopt a language. Jamie grew up singing the anthem of a country that turned its back on her although she still eats tacos and speaks Spanish with her family at home. She is actually very proud of her Latin roots. When you realize that you are Mexican, you think, cool, that's my flag, my blood. And then you arrive in Mexico and the people tell you, hey, you don't belong here, where do you come from? And so you answer, hey, if I'm not from here, nor there, where do I belong? The binational youth are organizing to form New Beginning, an independent group that helps deported people find jobs and adapt to Mexican society. When you knock the doors of the federal government, they play with our feelings. You realize that in Mexico, just like the U.S., they're playing chess with our lives and we still haven't found support. Until now, we haven't had access to public funds and must find our own opportunities. While Donald Trump's government asks for money to build a wall on the border, around the Revolution Monument, where many deported youngsters have found jobs, a binational community is growing. They are known as Little LA, referring to California City. Pablo Pérez García, Telesur, Ciudad de México. We'll take another short break. Join us after a look at what our multimedia team is reporting on.
welcome back. Revelations by a group of whistleblowers in Spain has hit the ruling Popular Party. More details in the next report. On Tuesday, former Popular Party treasurer Luis Barcenas testified at a hearing regarding illegal financing of the party. Payments primarily, assigning bills to certain companies and in order to charge party expenses. That was strictly prohibited. Businessmen initially confessed to having paid illegal commissions, and now Popular Party leaders are also recognizing their deeds in their attempts to reduce their sentences. What we're seeing, what's playing out, is all of the fights that were buried are being unearthed, brought to light through denunciations and back-and-forth accusations. This is a big corruption case that involves all the government parties financing. Although Mariano Rajoy was charged with collecting overpayments through his own treasurer, Luis Barcenas, he has, up till now, successfully dodged criminal proceedings and avoided penalties. It is very difficult to know how much of what we are seeing, how much is just for show of a controlled explosion, because yes, they are talking about things, but these things are never applied to the highest tiers of the popular party. Much of what is occurring is still out of the citizens' view. Palestinian teenager Ahed Tamimi's trial has begun in a closed Israeli military court as a judge banned journalists from attending. Her first court session on Tuesday lasted for two hours and her next hearing will be held on March 11th. 17-year-old Tamimi was arrested last December after a viral video showed her slapping and kicking two Israeli soldiers in the occupied West Bank. Her resistance to the Israeli forces has drawn international attention and is seen as a symbol of the Palestinian cause. Her closed-door trial has, has outraged her family and her lawyer. The court decided today to close doors in Ayat Amini's trial because the court is afraid of people coming into court and seeing what's happening. The systematic infringement of Palestinian children's rights. And Ayed is a member of the, she's the one that shows all of us how the rights are being infringed. As I have said, my sister has been killed in such a court and this why having diplomats and media crews present will keep this court monitored and won't let my daughter be alone in there. And so that the world can see this occupation for what it really Really is and how racist it is. Moving ahead, let's have a look at some other news from around the world. Police in South Africa have raided the homes of the Gupta family, a close ally of President Jacob Zuma, as part of probe into corruption charges linked to him. The police have arrested two people in the raid for questioning. There has been growing pressure on Zuma, who has been asked by the African National Congress Party to stand down as the head of the state. The ANC has announced that a no-confidence vote against Zuma will be held on Thursday. Breaking his silence over the controversy, Zuma said he has done no wrong. It's the first time I, I have a feeling that the leadership is, is unfair. It's not even helping me understand what is it that is so critical. It's just that, you know, you must just go. You must just go. I've got a problem with that. Dutch Foreign Minister Abla Zelstar has resigned after admitting to lying about attending a meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin in 2006. Zelstar had alleged that he personally heard Putin expressing ambitions to create a greater Russia in 2006. The incident has embarrassed the Dutch coalition government, which has a parliamentary majority of just one, and has further strained difficulties with Russia. Fans dressed up in traditional African attire gathered for the Kenyan premiere of Black Panther in the city of Kisumu, the hometown of actress Lupita Neons, who has a lead role in the movie. The film is an adaptation of Marvel Comics breakthrough black superhero story about a king of a fictional African nation. I'm really excited because I've never come to see a movie which is um, film is done and acted by uh, our African uh, superheroes. And I'm looking forward to see how Lupita's work. She's an amazing, amazing person. Passengers on board a United Airlines flight from San Francisco to Honolulu had a scary trip over the Pacific Ocean after the casing around one of the engines ripped apart. In the video filmed by one of the passengers, people are seen chanting brace while in the bracing position when the flight made its emergency landing. U.S. President Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, has admitted he paid an adult film star $130,000 weeks before the 2016 presidential elections. This comes after U.S. media reported the porn star was paid to keep her encounter with Trump a secret. 
In a statement, Cohen said the payment was made from his account and not by Donald Trump or the Trump Organization. We've come to the end of this news brief for these and many other stories. You can find them on our website at tv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you so much for watching.